G'day, and welcome to the AOS Coach sneak peek into the 2023 Beast of Chaos Battle Tome. Now, in this video, I'm going to heed the primordial call and share the blessings for the true children of chaos, including your allegiance abilities, and there has been some significant changes, the enhancements, the key war scroll changes, and the points. Now, Games Workshop did send me this book in advance before store release at no cost, but they won't see the video before it goes live. You'll also find a heap of narrative gems, path to glory, and a unique code to unlock the rules in the AOS app. Starting at the Allegiance level, you will notice a new sub-faction option in addition to the ones that you might be familiar with. Quake Frey is the new Great Frey, and I will showcase that a little later, and that will go along with all her Dark Walkers and Gave Spawn. Before we go any further, I want to brace you now that Primordial Core Points is no longer a thing. Not just changed, removed. Summoning is no longer a mechanic for the Beast of Chaos to worry about, which is going to make some of you sad and some of you happy. You still have the Beast Herd ambush and it has been slightly improved. Now during deployment, instead of setting up a Beast of Chaos unit on the battlefield, you can place it to one side and say that it is in ambush as a reserve unit. At the end of your first and second movement phase, you can set up any friendly reserve units that are in ambush on the battlefield. Now you set them up wholly within 9 inches of the battlefield edge and more than 9 inches from all enemy units. At the start of the third battle round, beasts of chaos units that are still in reserve are destroyed. You do get to add one to the charge roll for friendly beasts of chaos units that are set up on the battlefield in the same turn. It's worth calling out that this battle trait does allow you to put your whole army in reserve if you choose so, unless the battle plan says otherwise around reserve units. There's a couple of changes I want to call out. The first one is the one that I just spoke about. In the old book, you had to put down a unit on the table before you could put down a unit into reserve. Now that restriction is gone. The second one I want to call out is that you can bring on units from reserve in turn one and turn two. The other change I want to call out is in the old book, you had to deploy your unit from reserve within six inches of the table edge outside of nine of your enemy. Now you can come in from nine inches of any board edge and obviously outside of nine inches of the enemy. In addition to all of this, you get that plus one to your charge roll in the turn that they come in from the table edge. And the other restriction as well is it previously used to be locked to Bray Herd units. Now it's unlocked to everyone within Beasts of Chaos. So you could be coming in from reserve with your Bulgore, your Dragon Ogres, a Gorgon, a Cockatrice, you name it, whatever has the Beasts of Chaos keyword, it can come in from reserve. And to give you a little sneak peek, there is a command trait that allows you to bring in one unit from reserve outside of seven inches of an enemy. So very similar to what the Stormcast can do with the Lord Imperitant. The next ability ties in nicely with that Beast Herd Ambush, and that is Masters of the Wilderness. In your hero phase, if the model that is picked to be your general is in reserve, at the start of that phase you receive one command point. Now I really like that because you will notice in the rules, if your general is not on the table, even if it's in reserve and it hasn't been killed, uh, you wouldn't generate that command point. So you're probably wondering to yourself, what has replaced the Primordial Call Summoning ability? And I guess it's the Rituals of Ruin. In your hero phase, you can carry out one of the heroic actions from the table below with each friendly Beast of Chaos hero that is on the battlefield, in addition to any other heroic actions they can carry out from those heroes. Now, if you do so before resolving the effects from that heroic action, you must allocate D3 mortal wounds that cannot be negated to that hero or to another friendly Beast of Chaos unit that is within three inches of that hero. If those mortal wounds slay the hero, the heroic action has no effect. Now in addition, in your hero phase, you can carry out one of the heroic actions from the table. In addition, in your hero phase, you can carry out one of the heroic actions from the table below by one friendly beast of chaos hero that's in reserve. If you do so before resolving the effects of that heroic action, you must allocate D3 mortal wounds that cannot be negated by that hero, and because you're from reserve, you're not going to be able to pass them on to another unit. If those mortal wounds slay that hero that's in reserve, the heroic action has no effect, 
If the heroic action instructs you to pick an enemy unit, you also must pick one point on the battlefield edge. Now that point is considered to be the hero carrying out the heroic action for the purposes of measuring range and visibility. And if the heroic action instructs you to pick a friendly unit, you must pick the hero carrying out the heroic action. Now the same heroic action from the table below cannot be carried out more than once per phase. And you'll notice there are four heroic actions. Warping Curse allows you to pick one enemy unit that is within 12 inches of a Beast of Chaos hero carrying out the heroic action and it's visible to them. That unit's going to suffer D6 mortal wounds. Blood Taunt makes you pick one enemy unit that's within 12 inches of a Beast of Chaos hero carrying out the heroic action and is more than 3 inches from all friendly units and is visible to that hero. Now that opponent must make a 2d6 move with that unit that you choose. All of the models from that unit must finish that move as close as possible to the Beast of Chaos hero that carried out the heroic action and it must be more than three inches from all other units from your army. So they can't sneak into combat and tag you. They've got to stay outside of three, but they do need to move closer to you. Brands of Wild Fury lets you pick one friendly Beast of Chaos hero that is wholly within 12 inches of the Beast of Chaos hero carrying out the heroic action, and it's visible to them. Until the end of this turn, friendly Beast of Chaos units will have a six plus ward save while they're wholly within 12 inches of the hero that you picked. The final one is the Alpha Beast Instinct. You get to pick one friendly Beast of Chaos unit that is wholly within 12 inches of the Beast of Chaos hero carried out the heroic action and is visible to them. Now that unit is not going to take Battleshock tests this turn. I'm a big fan of the Blood Taunt heroic action because it can pull units off objectives, it can pull units out of buff ranges of heroes, it could make your charges easier because they're moving close to you. There's a lot of flexibility here with the Blood Taunt that I really like. I also like the Alpha Beast Instincts because it's going to help you kind of combat some of that low bravery that is in Beast of Chaos, while the Warping Curse and the Brands of the Wild Fury do have some good situational uses. There are six command traits to choose from. Bestial Cunning after deployment lets you pick one friendly Beast of Chaos unit that's in reserve. Now when you set this up at the end of your movement phase, you can set it up anywhere on the battlefield more than seven inches from all enemy units. With Propagator of Ruin, if this general is on the battlefield and you pick them to carry out the heroic action from the Rituals of Ruin battle trait that we just spoke about, you can carry out a second different heroic action from that Rituals of Ruin battle trait with this general in the phase, and you do not have to allocate mortal wounds to the general before resolving the effects for a second time. With the Skullfay Gorehorn, while this general is within 3 inches of an enemy unit, you get to add 1 to the attack characteristic of melee weapons used by friendly Beasts of Chaos Brayherd units that are wholly within 12 inches of this general. The Twist Fay Curse Beast adds the number of the current battle round to the casting roll for the general. The Rotfray Plague Pelt, at the start of the combat phase, roll a dice for each enemy unit within 3 inches of the general. On a 2 plus, that unit's going to suffer D3 mortal wounds. And the Slake Fray Reveler, if this general is on the battlefield at the start of your movement phase, add 3 inches to the movement characteristic of friendly Beasts of Chaos units that start a normal move within 6 inches of a terrain feature until the end of that phase. Of the command choices that I'm initially drawn to from the book, Bestial Cunning is going to allow me to bring on a real threat piece from reserve outside of 7 inches of enemies, and with my plus 1 to charge in the turn that I deploy them onto the tabletop, it's going to allow me to get a really reliable charge, especially if that unit can issue its own command and you could reroll the charge as well, obviously with a command point. I'm also drawn to the Twist for a Cursed Beast that's going to significantly improve my spell casting as the game progresses. Although you also might like the Skull Fray Gorehorn for that plus one attack characteristic, but it's going to mean your general has to be within three inches of an enemy. So depending, I guess, who your general is going to be and if they're going to be good to be in combat. Um, there's a lot to like here. I guess it just depends on how you're building your list and what's most important to you. There are also six artifacts to choose from. The Slitherak Helm, after the bearer makes a charge move, you get to pick one enemy unit within one inch of them and roll a dice. On a two plus, the strike last effect's going to apply to that unit until the end of the turn. 
The Bray Blast Trumpet, once per battle, at the end of your movement phase, you can say that the bearer is going to sound the Bray Blast Trumpet. If you do so, roll a dice on a 2+, plus. you can summon one unit of either 10 Gore, 10 Ungor, or 10 Ungor Raiders to the battlefield, and you get to add that to your army. On a roll of a 1, you can still summon either the Gore, the Ungor, or the Ungor Raiders, but you must do so at the end of your next movement phase instead, so you delay the turn. You can set that unit up wholly within 9 inches of the battle edge and more than 9 inches from all enemy units. With the Knowing Eye, if you take the first turn in the current battle round, after the players have received their starting command points, you receive one command point that can only be spent during that turn to allow the bearer to issue a command. Now, if you take the second turn in the current battle round, after the players receive their starting command points, the bearer can make a normal 6-inch move. The Axe of Morgur picks one of the bearer's melee weapons. Ward rolls cannot be made for wounds caused by attacks made by this weapon. The Bleeding Null Staff, at the end of your movement phase, you can pick one objective or terrain feature within 6 inches of the bearer and roll a dice. On a 2 plus, each unit within 6 inches of the objective or the terrain feature is going to suffer D3 mortal wounds, and this ability has no effect on Beasts of Chaos units. Finally, the Blackened Talisman of Chaos, each time the bearer is affected by a spell or a prayer, or the abilities of an endless spell or an invocation, you get to roll a dice. On a 4 plus, you get to ignore the effects of that spell or prayer or effect of an ability from that endless spell or invocation on the bearer. If you think you're going to miss your summoning, you're likely to be drawn to the Bray Blast Trumpet, say that three times. The Knowing Eye is an interesting choice to either get the free command point or the extra move, although it's going to be hard to determine which one you get at the right time. The other one that might interest you would be the Slick Wrath Helm on a more combat-focused hero like a Doom Bull that's going to help make your enemy fight last on the charge. There are two spell laws in this book, one for the Brayherd Wizards and the other for the Thunderscorn Wizards. Now this isn't story time with Coach and I'm not going to read out every single spell, but I will pick out some of my favourites. Anyone who's fought against a Nurgle army with a sloppity biopiper knows how frustrating it can be to fight when you can't pile in. So the first one I'm drawn to is the Vicious Strangle Thorns, which is actually quite easy to cast with a value of 5 and a range of 18. And if successfully cast, pick one enemy unit that's within range and visible to the caster. That enemy unit cannot make a pile in move until your next hero phase. Tendrils of Astrophy is a nice way to improve the damage output. It has a casting value of 7 and a range of 12. If successfully cast, you pick one enemy unit that's within range and visible. Add one to the damage inflicted by each successful attack made by a melee weapon that targets that unit until your next hero phase. The other damage dealer I like is the Wild Rampage that has a casting value of 7 and a range of 12. If successfully cast, pick one friendly Beast of Chaos unit that's wholly within range and visible to the caster. Until your next hero phase, if the unmodified hit roll for an attack made with a melee weapon by a unit is a 6, that attack scores 2 hits on the target instead of 1. You make your wound and your save rolls as normal. Furious Gale could be an interesting choice in the current season if your opponent has focused on the Galatian Sharpshooter Battalion, although it is rather useless against non-shooting armies. It has a casting value of 6 and a range of 18. Until your next hero phase, subtract 1 from the attack characteristic of missile weapons used by enemy units while they're within range of the caster to a minimum of 1. The other spell I'd call out is Hailstorm, and it's probably still my favourite from the Thunderscorn spell lore. It has a generous range and a powerful debuff to movement, run, and charge, and I'm having flashbacks to that Corn Demon Prince that we just got rid of. If successfully cast, pick one enemy unit that is within range and visible to the caster, and until your next hero phase, halve the movement characteristic of that unit, as well as halve the run rolls and the charge rolls for that unit. You've got four sub-factions to choose from, and you already know there's a new Great Fray called the Quake Fray. All heard at the end of the Battleshock phase, you can return D3 plus 3 models to each friendly All Heard Gore, which I think is just Gore from what I can see, as well as Ungore and your Ungore Raiders. 
Gavespawn unlocks the Gibbering Congregation, which is an alternative war scroll for a set of three Chaos Spawns that you might like and it will fulfill your battle line requirements. You will see it later in this video. Dark Walkers, at the end of your movement phase, you can pick one friendly Dark Walkers Gore, Ungore, or Ungore Raiders that is wholly within nine inches of a battle edge and say that it will slink into the shadows. Now, if you do so, remove this unit from the battlefield and set it up again wholly within nine inches of a battle edge and more than nine inches from all enemy units. Your new sub faction, the Quake Fray, is going to give friendly Quake Fray Saigor units the priest keyword. That's pretty cool. In addition, friendly Quake Fray Saigor priests know the following prayer in addition to any others that they might know. And that prayer is Earth Shatter and it has an answer value of 3 and a range of 12. Now if answered, you pick one objective that is within range and visible to the chanter. Each unit within 6 inches of that objective is going to suffer D3 mortal wounds. And until your next hero phase, when determining the number of models in the unit that's contesting that objective, the number is going to be halved rounding down, and it has no effect on Beasts of Chaos units. Now, as expected, you do have Grand Strategies and Battle Tactics. Your Grand Strategies have been expanded since the Wife Dwarf. You've kept Protect the Herdstone and you've gained three more. Protect the Herdstone, when the battle ends, you complete the Grand Strategy if there are no enemy units within nine inches of the Herdstone. And the Herdstone was not affected by a rule that says you can't use the scenery rules on the War Scroll, so like Smash to Rubble. Desecrating Bray Herd when the battle ends, you complete the grand strategy if you control two or more objectives, and those objectives are contested by friendly Bray Herd units. Flanking War Herd when the battle ends, you complete the grand strategy if there are two or more friendly War Herd units on the battlefield, wholly within nine inches of a battlefield edge. Age of the Beast when the battle ends, you complete the grand strategy if two or more friendly Saigor or Gorgon units are on the battlefield, and none of those units have a number of wounds allocated that exceeds half of their wounds characteristic. Of the book grand strategies, I think Protect the Herdstone is still my favourite because you've got the bodies to protect it. Outside of that, maybe Desecrating Bray Herd is my next favourite, but I'd have to be running an army that's invested into Bray Herd. It might be another reason why you want to bring the Bray Blast Trumpet Artifact to summon more Bray Herd. Next up, you've got your Battle Tactics, and in the Shadow of the Herdstone, you get to pick one enemy unit within 12 inches of the Herdstone, and you complete the tactic if this unit is destroyed in this turn. Bestial Wrath can only be picked in your first or second turn, and you complete the tactic if your general and two other friendly Beasts of Chaos units are within three inches of an enemy at the end of this turn. Rampaging Beast Herd, you pick one objective controlled by your opponent. You complete the tactic if you control that objective at the end of this turn, and that objective is contested by a friendly unit that has ten or more models. Reduced to Savagery, you pick one enemy unit on the battlefield and you complete this tactic if that unit is picked as the target of a heroic action from the Rituals of Ruin, the one, the Allegiance ability ones, and you've destroyed them in this turn. Trampled to Mulch is completed if any enemy units are destroyed during this turn by mortal wounds allocated in your charge phase. Aid of the Wilderness is complete if there are two or more Beasts of Chaos units in cover wholly outside your territory at the end of this turn. There are a lot of interesting battle tactics, but many of these are situational. Bestial Wrath sounds achievable, but your goal is to not destroy that unit that you're in combat with, which might seem counterintuitive at the time. Aid of the Wilderness is going to be easy to score if there is terrain within 9 inches of a table edge that you can come in from reserve from. Rampaging Beast Herd is another one that I can see you using often. Next up is our War Scroll changes, and let's start off with your Faction Terrain, the Herdstone. You've lost Locus of Savagery, which used to give you the 4 plus rally, and it would reduce the amount of models fleeing from a Battleshock test, and there has been a change within Tropic Lodestone. From the start of the second battle round, improve the Ren characteristic of melee weapons used by friendly Beasts of Chaos units on the battlefield by 1, 
from the start of the fourth battle round improved the Ren characteristic of melee weapons used by friendly beasts of chaos units on the battlefield by two instead of one. The key change with the Entropic Lodestone is that it used to start in Battle Round 1 and then it would improve in Battle Round 3. It's basically delayed a turn since the last update, which will be impactful considering a lot of the game has already happened by turn 3 and those critical combats have occurred and possibly whittling down. The Beast Lord has gained an extra wound and it's now six wounds characteristic. Uh, when you look at the melee profile, it has lost an attack. It's now down to five attacks, but the damage characteristic on the melee weapon is now damage two. It used to be damage one. It has lost the Grizzly Trophy, which used to be a buff to Brayherd units if it killed the model. It has got a change when it comes to the Hatred of Heroes. If this unit is within 3 inches of an enemy hero, you get to add 1 to the hit rolls and wound rolls for attacks made by melee weapons by friendly beasts of chaos units while they're wholly within 12 inches of this unit. It used to be exploding 6s to hit. Uh, I would argue this is a lot better, getting plus 1 to hit and plus 1 to wound. You also have a change with the Call of Battle. Now, in the combat phase, when you pick this unit to fight for the first time in that phase, you can pick one other friendly Brayherd unit that is not a hero, that's wholly within 12 inches of this unit, and also hasn't fought yet in this phase. Now this unit and the other Brayherd unit can fight one after each other in the order of your choosing. This used to be a run and charge ability for the Beast Lord. Again, this is probably a bit nicer to getting two fights in a sequence as opposed to one. It's gained an ability called Dual Axes, and if the unmodified hit roll for the attack made by the melee weapon for this unit is a 6, that attack causes a number of mortal wounds to the target equal to the weapon characteristic and the attack sequence going to end, so don't make a wound or a save roll. The Great Bray Shaman has got plus 1 to its save, so it's now a save of 5 up. It's also gained a point in its bravery, so it's now bravery 7. There has been a change with the fetish staff and it's now range two, three attacks, hits on threes, wounds on threes, no rend for two damage. There's been a change with infused with bestial vigor. It now adds six inches to the range of heroic actions from the rituals of ruin battle trait if you carry it out with this unit. Now it used to give you a plus three movement to your bray herd as long as it was wholly within 12 inches. Now you're extending those uh, heroic actions by six inches. The last change with the Great Bray Shaman is in the Devolve spell. It's a spell with a casting value of 7 and a range 18. If successfully cast, you pick one enemy unit within range and visible to the caster. And until your next hero phase, you get to roll 3d6. And before that unit makes a normal move, run, retreat, or it makes a charge move, if the roll is greater than the unit's bravery characteristic, the maximum distance of the move is halved. So similar to some of the shenanigans, but the spell feels a lot more superior than what the Volve used to be. Next up is Grashrak, Fellhoof, and the Despoilers. Um, it's had a number of changes. It's gained a boost in its save. It's now save of a 5 up. The Bravery has gone up to 7. The now has 6 wounds, the hero. Grashrak has 6 wounds, and the Despoilers now have 2 wounds each. There has been some minor improvements in the Missile and the Melee profiles. Infused by Bestial Vigor, I just spoke about, it's the same rule. You get to add 6 inches to the range of the heroic actions of, of the Rituals of Ruin battle trait, if you use Grashrak to do that. The last change is the Violent Despoilers, and you get to add 1 to hit rolls if this unit is wholly outside your territory. Now, formerly this used to be enemy territory, so it's now going to be more beneficial with those battle plans that have neutral territories that aren't yours or aren't mine. Next up is your Gore, and they've had a Bravery boost. They've gone up to Bravery 6. That's a plus 1 to their Bravery. Their Gore Blades is now 2 attacks. The Pair of Blades is now 3 attacks, and both of those profiles wound on 3s. There's been a change with the Shield, and the Shield is now improving your save characteristic to 4 up, as opposed to giving you a plus 1 to your save. 
The standard bearer has changed to give you a five up rally. Formerly, it used to give you a plus one to your movement and pile in. Now, although you lost your four up rally from the herdstone, the uh, standard bearer of the gauze is going to give you a five up rally natively. The musician is going to give you plus one to your run and charge rolls. It used to allow you to run and charge. Now it's just plus one to run and plus one to charge. It's gained the Gore Stampede. At the end of your charge phase, if this unit has made a charge move in the same turn, you can pick one enemy unit within one inch of this Gore unit that has fewer models than the Gores and roll a dice. On a 3+, the Strike Last effect applies to that unit in the following combat phase. Finally, it lost the Rend and Tear, which with your pair of blades used to give you a re-roll of ones to hit, and your Anarchy and Mayhem ability, where you used to get plus one attack when there was 20 or more models. Both of them are gone. The best of Gores might have been my favorite glow up in this book. They've increased their bravery, so now bravery of seven, and they have two wounds apiece, which is a massive increase from one to two. Their Despoiler Axe has become range 2, and they're now hitting on 3s, they used to hit on 4s. They have the exact same Standard Bearer and Musician rules that I just spoke about from the Gore. There's a change in the Despoiler's ability, and you get to add 1 to the attack characteristic of melee weapons while it's within 3 inches of an enemy unit that has received all that defense command in the same phase. Love that. The other change is in the bestial charge, and that is minus one to wound rolls for attacks that target this unit. If the attack is made by a missile weapon, by a unit that has received Unleash Hell Command in the same phase. With your Ungore, they've received a boost in their move, save, and bravery. So they're now move of seven, uh, a save of five up, and their bravery is five, so all increasing by one. Both the melee profiles improved, so they're both hitting on fours, wounding on fours. Uh, the pitted blade is now two attacks. The short spear is adding a shooting attack now, so it's a range eight shooting attack. One attack, uh, hit on a four, wound on a four, no rend for one damage. Uh, the standard bearer and the musician as well, exactly the same as the gore. They have lost the baying hatred and the half shield abilities but they have gained a new rule called Fleet of Hoof. In the combat phase, when you pick this unit to fight, you can say that it will evade the enemy. If you do so, the unit retreats instead of fighting. Ungor Raiders had a plus one to their movement, their save, and their bravery as well, so they're now move of seven, save of five up, and a bravery of five. The Raider Bow has now become a 12-inch range. It used to be 18, so it's lost six inches from its shooting attack. The Standard Bearer and the Musician is the same as the Gore. It did lose an ability called the Vile Invaders, which was at pre-game move of six inches, unfortunately. I know that was a very popular rule, and the Baying Anger was also removed off the War Scroll. It has gained a new rule, though, that I quite like called Hidden Volley. Now, once per battle at the start of your movement phase, if this unit is in reserve, you can pick a point on the battlefield edge and say that this unit is going to unleash a Hidden Volley. If you do so, this unit can shoot in that phase, but it must target the closest enemy unit to the point that you pick. If there's more than one enemy that's tied to that closest, you pick which unit you target. So basically, while the Ungor Raiders are in reserve, once per game you can shoot even though they're not on the board. That's kind of cool. Possibly my other favorite glow up here is the Centigors that have had a plus one to their save and their bravery. So they're now a uh, save of four up and their bravery of five up. There has been a change in both the melee profiles and they're both improved. So the Gut Piercer Spear is hitting and wounding on threes and it now has a rend of minus one. While the Clawed Four Limbs hit and wound on fours. And they've gained the Gut Piercer Spear Missile Attack. So it's a range of eight, one attack, hitting on threes, wounding on threes, rend one for one. There's been a change to the musician that's going to give you plus one to your run and charge rolls and the standard bearer is going to allow you to retreat and charge um that ability used to be on the musician and the standard bearer used to let you uh get plus one to your move and to your pile in so that that clearly is gone so now the standard bearer is letting you retreat and charge it lost the Beast Buckler ability, which used to give you plus one to your save in melee. And you also lost the Charging Spear ability that used to let you re-roll wounds uh, when you charge with the spear. 
There's a significant change in drunken revelry, and the first two wounds or mortal wounds caused to this unit in the combat phase, they're going to be negated. So every combat phase, they get to negate two wounds or mortal wounds, combat only. In addition, if a model in this unit is going to flee as a result of a failed Battleshock test, on a 2+, plus, that model doesn't flee. Finally, it's gained Unruly Hooligans, and you get to add one to the attack characteristic of this unit's melee weapons, while it's wholly within 9 inches of an objective that you do not control. Next up is the Tuscor Chariot, and it has gained a boost in its bravery. It's now Bravery 7, and it's got 7 wounds, both going up 1. There's been a bunch of changes with the various weapons improving across the board. The Gnarled Spear is now a shooting and melee weapon that does 2 damage. They mostly hit on threes now. There's a bunch of changes. Uh, it also lost the spoilers rule that used to give you plus one to hit on the axe if there was 10 or more models. The last change is the Tusk or Charge. Now, after this unit has made a charge move, you can pick one enemy unit within one inch of this unit and roll a dice equal to the unmodified charge roll. So you roll the 10 inch charge, you get to roll 10 dice. Now, for each five up, that unit's going to suffer one mortal wound. You get to add one to that dice roll if the enemy has a wounds characteristic of one or two. So you play onto my Gloom Spike Gits on a four up, you're going to do a bunch of mortal wounds on that unmodified charge roll. So that's pretty nice. The Chaos Warhounds have now got two wounds each, so they've increased from one wound to two wounds each. And the Slavering Jaw is a three up to wound. It's gone up from fours to threes. The other change is in Outrunners of Chaos. Now, when you make a charge roll for this unit, you can change one of the dice rolls to be a four. So this is going to guarantee you a minimum of a five inch charge. It's certainly going to make your charges a little bit easier if you bring them in from ambush. Uh, formerly, I think this was uh, plus six inches to its move. So uh, definitely a lot better when you think about the fact that it's now got two wounds each. The Beast of Chaos, Chaos Spawn, has a change. It's now a 3d6 move. It used to be 2d6 move. It did lose the ability called Curse of the Dark Gods, which allowed you to keyword uh, to a Chaos God. I don't know how much value that was. But it did gain Propagator of Devolution, and this allows the Chaos Spawn to run and still charge later in the turn. If you remember when we talked about the Gave Spawn sub-faction, the rule that you got was a gibbering congregation in your army. That's not a unit, but what it is, is uh, the gibbering congregation is a unit of three Morgorite Chaos Spawns. So this is only available for the Gave Spawn, not accessible outside of Gave Spawn. And what it is, is it's three Chaos Spawns, specific these ones, the Morgorite ones. Um, and you'll notice here that it has a much more consistent profile. It's a move of 10, it has a save of 5 up, it has a bravery of 10, and it has 5 wounds. Uh, the missile weapon is the Spews of Corruption, which is a range of C uh, 8, D6 attacks, hits on 3s, wounds on 3s, Ren 1 for 2 damage. The melee profile is the Bizarre Mutations with a 1-inch range, 8 attacks, hits on 3s, wounds on 3s, no Ren for 1. There's a couple of cool abilities. One is the Aura of Insanity. Subtract one from the attack characteristics of weapons used by enemy units while they're within one inch of this unit, so a minimum of one. It also has the Propagator of Devolution, which allows the Morgorite Chaos Spawn to run and charge in the same turn. The keywords is Chaos, Beast of Chaos, and Morgorite Chaos Spawn. Uh, and as I mentioned, you have to take three of these and it will fulfill your battle line. So all three of those will be ticked. Next up is your War Herd and your Doom Bull has now got two damage on its horns. It used to be only one and the attack from the axe has gone down to be Rend 1. So the axe used to be Rend 2. You've gained extra damage, but the Rend has de decreased. It has gained a rule called Alpha Charge, and when this unit makes a charge move, you can pick one enemy unit within one inch of the Doom Bull and roll a dice. On a 2+, plus, that unit suffers D3 mortal wounds at the end of the phase. There's been a change in Blood Greed, and if the unmodified hit roll for the attack made by the melee weapon is a 6, the attack causes a number of mortal wounds to the target equal to the damage characteristic, so do not make a wound or a save roll. Uh, this was, if you roll a 6-2 wound, it dealt one mortal wound, so I guess that's a, a boost. 
And there's also the Slaughterer's Call has been changed as well. Now, you can use this command ability at the start of the combat phase. This unit must issue the command and the unit that receives the command must be a friendly Warherd unit that is within 12 inches of an enemy unit and more than 3 inches of all enemy units. So it can't already be in combat, but it must be within 12 inches of an enemy. If you do use this command, uh, that unit must attempt to charge. Now, it used to be a plus one to wound ability, but I guess if you look at the Slaughterer's Call now, you might be wondering why would I want to charge in the combat phase? Well, first off, you might want to avoid an Unleash Hell, but more importantly, let's say you fail the charge in the charge phase and you really want to get that unit of Warherd into combat. This would allow you to charge still, even though you failed. So you failed in the, in the charge phase. This allows you to charge in the combat phase. That's not too bad. Next up is your bull gore, and there is a variety of melee weapons that have changed. Most notably, the Great Axe is now Rend 1. The horns are now damage 2, very similar to what we just talked about with the Doom Bull. The Paired Axes is now 4 attacks. Uh, it has lost its rerolls to hit of 1s, though. It's gained a similar charge rule to the Doom Bull called the War Herd Charge. After this unit has made a charge move, you can pick one enemy unit within one inch of this unit and roll a dice for each model in the Bulgore unit. On a 2+, plus, that unit is going to suffer one mortal wound at the end of the phase. The standard bearer has changed and now you can re-roll the dice to see if you do any mortal wounds off the Warherd charge. The shield is going to change the save characteristic to a flat 4 up. It used to be just plus 1 to save. And the Blood Greed is the same rule as the Doom Bull. The Gorgon has received two extra wounds, so it's now a characteristic of 16 wounds. And the damage table now to see its efficiency has gone from 0 to 6, 7 to 9, 10 to 12, and 13 plus. The Butchering Blades now starts at 7 attacks, and it's still tied to the damage table. Uh, it hits on 4s, wounds on 2s, so it used to be 3s and 3s. The Moor is now doing two attacks, so it's gained an extra attack. The Wounds on two for the Moor, uh, and it no longer degrades, so the, the Moor is no longer tied to the damage table. It's lost Ravenous Blood Greed. Swallowed Hole has changed, and there is a lot of similarities to the old rule, except now you get to pick three models within three inches. Uh, unwounded, so because it's tied to your damage table, it used to only be one roll and it had to be within one inch of the Gorgon, so now you get to roll three dice within three inches. If you beat the roll, you also get to heal the number of wounds equal to the slain model. So you still get to remove some models, except now you're going to heal a little bit as well, which is kind of cool. The Feast on Flesh has also changed, so improve the Ren characteristic of this unit's melee weapon by one until the end of the combat phase. In addition, until the end of the following combat phase, if any enemy models were slain by attacks made by this unit, you can heal up to three wounds allocated to this unit after all of its attacks have been resolved. It's a minor change, but it's now capped to three wounds that you can heal through Feast on Flesh. Next up is the Saigor, and it too gained some extra wounds. It's now a wounds characteristic of 16, and its damage table is consistent with the Gorgon as well. So 0 to 6, 7 to 9, 10 to 12, and 13 plus. Desecrated Boulders has a range of 12, so it used to be 18. Uh, it's damage 5 when you're unwounded, but that profile does degrade to eventually 2 damage on 13 wounds. Uh, it hits on 3, so it's improved from 4s. From um, and as I mentioned, it, it's flat 5 damage when you're unwounded. It used to be D6, so you've got a lo lot more consistency now from the Desecrated Boulders. There has been a change with the Massive Horns. It's now starting at 7 attacks. It's still tied to the damage table. Uh, it hits on threes uh, and it's now damage two. So it used to hit on fours and it used to be one damage. There has been a change with Soul Eater. It's still a two spell unbinding unit, but it has gained some extra text. In addition, each time an enemy wizard within 30 inches of a friendly unit with this ability successfully casts a spell, and that spell is not unbound, 
The caster suffers one mortal wound after the effects of that spell have been resolved. Previously, it used to be only one mortal wound if you successfully unbound it. Now, each time an enemy wizard within 30 inches successfully casts a spell, boom, one mortal wound. Uh, it did also lose the ability called Ghost Sight. There's been a couple of changes to the Chaos Gargant. The first one is a consistent move of 8 inches. Previously, it was a degrading profile against the damage table. No longer. The Mighty Kicks is now Rend minus 1. That has, that has actually reduced, so it used to be Rend minus 2. The Massive Club now starts at 5 attacks. It used to be uh, 3d6 attacks, so you're getting some more consistency, but... Uh, less variable, I guess. You don't have the spike, but you also don't have the, the crap roll. Uh, and it also does two damage now, which is uh, consistent to what's happened over in the Sons of Behemoth, where it's got less attacks on the club, but higher damage. The Edbutt is now Rend minus two. It used to be Rend minus three, and it starts now at damage four. It used to be a damage six, I think, Edbutt. It's lost the Drunken Stagger rule, which I'm a big fan of, where if you roll the double on the charge, the Gargant would fall over because it's drunk. Um, so you, you've completely lost this roll, which is awesome. It was a really bad rule to begin with. Um, the Whipped into a Frenzy has changed as well. So at the start of the combat phase, if this unit is within six inches of any friendly Beast of Chaos heroes, you get to add one to the attack characteristic of the unit's melee weapons until the end of that phase. It used to be three inches, and you used to take a mortal wound if you got whipped into a frenzy. Now you got a better range, and you're not taking the mortal wound. The other rule it's actually gained is called the Aura of Foulness, and that subtracts one to the save rolls for enemy units within three inches of this Chaos Gargant. The next change is in the Razor Gore. Now the melee weapon has lost the rend. It's now rend nothing, but it does damage too. It did lose the ability called Uncontrollable Stampede, but it did gain two extra rules. It gained Feed on Mangled Remains, and at the end of each phase, you can heal one wound allocated to this unit if it's within six inches of an enemy unit that has had any models slain in that phase. The other rule it's gained is Baited Charge. If this unit is within three inches of a friendly Ungore unit at the end of your charge phase, and this unit has made a charge in the same turn, double the attack characteristics of this unit's melee weapons until the end of that turn. The Dragon Ogre Shagoth has gained a Crackling Bolts missile attack. That's a range of 12, 2d6 attacks, hits on threes, wounds on threes, rend one for one damage. There's been some other changes in the attack profile. The axe is now five attacks. It used to be three. It's now damage two. It's gone down from damage three down to damage two. The tail is now doing D6 attacks. It used to be D3. It hits on threes, damage two. Uh, the four limb is now four attacks. It used to only be two. Um, it's gone down, unfortunately. There's no rend now on the four limbs. It used to be rend one. There's been a change in the Beneath the Tempest. At the end of the combat phase, roll a dice for this unit. On a 2+, plus, you can heal up to D3 wounds allocated to this unit. And in addition, at the end of the combat phase, roll a dice for each enemy unit within 3 inches of this unit with this ability, so the Dragon Ogre Shagoth. On a 2+, plus, that unit suffers D3 mortal wounds. So this used to be an ability at the start of the battle round, so you're going to get more opportunities to do the heal and the D3 damage, I think is a new thing. So the heal used to be on a 4-up, I think it's now on a 2-up, so you've also improved the likelihood of doing um, the heal as well. So I guess win-win there. The Scions of the Primordial Storm is a new ability. On a 4-up, you get to ignore the effects of spells and abilities of Endless Spells. And there's been a change in Summoned Lightning. So it's now a range of 24. It heals D3 Thunderscorn units, uh, D3 wounds. Uh, but it no longer lets you re-roll failed wound rolls. Again, no surprise, a lot of re-rolls are being removed from the game. The Dragon Ogres have had a couple of changes. The weapon profiles have all merged into a single profile. So the paired ancient weapons, the Draconic Warglaive and the Draconic Crushers, they've all merged. Uh, it's now a profile called the Stormforge Weapons. It's a two inch range, five attacks each, hitting on threes, wounding on threes, Ren minus one for two damage. 
There's been a change in the storm rage, so if this unit makes a charge move in the same turn, if the unmodified hit roll for the attack made by this unit is a 6, that attack wounds automatically, so don't make a, a wound roll, but certainly your opponent gets to make a save roll. Finally, it gained the Beneath the Tempest rule, which is exactly the same to the Dragon Ogre Shagoth. Something that I'm excited to talk about is the Slangor Fiend Blood, and anyone with a keen eye who's been watching Warhammer Community might have seen some of the photos with Beast of Chaos where Slangor were in the back hiding. Now, not only are they hiding, but I think they're going to come to the forefront because I think they've had a little bit of a glow up, but you tell me in the comment section if they've had a glow up. The first one is they've had a change in the razor sharp claws. It's now four attacks, so they've gained an extra attack there, and they're doing two damage on uh, each of the razor sharp claws. There's been a change with slaughter at any cost. Now, at the end of any phase, if any wounds or mortal wounds were allocated to this unit in that phase, and this unit, the Slangor Fiend Bloods, are more than nine inches from all enemy units. It can make a move of up to D6. So it used to be plus one attack on the charge. Now it's going to get a bonus move if it takes some damage. The other one and why I'm more excited about this is obsessive violence. Once per battle in the combat phase, after this unit's fought for the first time, you can say that it will continue its obsessive onslaught. If you do so, this unit can fight for a second time in that phase, but your slam gore are going to strike last for the second time that they fight. Next up is your Jabba Slythe, and the Slythe Tongue Missile Attack is a range of 10, so it was 9. Uh, it's D3 damage, it used to only be 1. The Vorpal Claw is now flat rend, I think it used to be rend 2. The Spike Tail is now rend 1, it's gone down from rend 2s. It seems to have lost the ability to fly, and it's lost the rule called Aura of Madness. Now note that I say old, because there is another rule that they've just renamed as Aura of Madness. So the old Aura of Madness is minus one to casting and unbinding for enemy wizards within six inches. So there was some bravery shenanigans as well. That Aura of Madness is gone. The other change that's happened is in Tropic Miasma. That used to be a monstrous rampage. They've just renamed it as Aura of Madness. It's the same rule, it's just they've renamed in Tropic Miasma to Aura of Madness. The Cockatrice has gained a boost to its bravery. It's now bravery of six. There has been a change to Petrifying Gaze. It's now an ability, so it's not a shooting attack profile. It's range of six, it's gone down from 10. And on a 4-up, it deals D3 mortal wounds, so it used to be D6. In addition, if any mortal wounds caused by this ability are allocated to a unit, until the end of that phase, only unmodified hit rolls of 6 for attacks made with melee weapons by that unit score a hit. The same unit cannot be affected by this ability more than once per phase. The other change with the Cockatrice is the Beak hits on 3s, it's now Rend nothing and damage 2, so it used to be hitting on 4s, it used to have Rend 1 and D3 damage. The Talons are down to 3 attacks, uh, it hits on a 3 and it wounds on a 3 and it's damage 2. The Chimera no longer has a damage profile, so it doesn't degrade over time, but it's also lost its Vicious Charge, which used to give you plus 2 to your charge roll. There has been a change with the Fiery Breath, it's now a range of 12, it used to be range 14. Uh, it does a flat D3 mortal wounds though, so it was D6, but it used to degrade against the monster profile, now it's just flat 3 regardless. The other change is while the melee profile is mostly unchanged, the Avian Head now only does rend minus 1, it used to be rend minus 3. The Draconic Head now wounds on 3s and does 2 damage, and the Leone Head has lost its rend. When it comes to your Zangor, all of the Zangor are updated exactly the same as the Zinch update. So if you want to look at the War Scroll, uh, it's there's exactly the same in the AOS app as what Zinch has, so go check that out. And finally, when it comes to War Scroll changes, we have our Endless Spells. The Ravening Dire Flock has gained Predatory, so this Endless Spell can move up to 8 inches and fly. Uh, the parts must remain within 3 inches of each other. 
There has been a change in the Harbringer of Dark Omens and the model cannot issue rally or inspiring presence commands while they're within six inches of this endless spell and it doesn't affect Beasts of Chaos units. So this used to be 12, but in the olden days it didn't move. So I guess now that it's predatory and it can move eight inches and fly, you probably will get better coverage from the Harbringers of Dark Omen if you play it correctly. It did lose the Black Souled Cowardice but it did gain an ability called the Stalking Shadow. Now you get to roll a dice each time an enemy model issues a command within six inches of this endless spell. On a five up, this command is not received. The command ability still counts as being issued, so the opponent cannot try to issue it again. And the command point is spent, so they've completely lost it even though they didn't actually get to issue that command. The Doom Blast has had a change where when the Endless Spell is set up, its range is 6 inches, and at the start of each subsequent battle round, the range increases by 6. Now, if you're within the bubble, you subtract 1 from your wound roll for attacks made by units within that range of the ability, and the ability has no effect on Beasts of Chaos units. If you do dispel the Endless Spell and you resummon it, uh, it goes back to its starting range of 6 inches. So it used to only be 3 inch and it used to expand by 3 inch and it was only minus 1 to hit. I think the minus 1 to wound is definitely more impactful and now the range is significantly increasing. The Wildfire Taurus, I noticed no change whatsoever between uh, the old book and the new book. So as you probably can tell, there has been a lot of War Scrolls being changed, so it makes sense that there's going to be some points movement. So you've seen some points discounts on things like the Beast of Chaos Zangor Shaman, that's gone down 20 points. The Chaos Gargan and the Chimera have gone down 15 points. The Cockatrice, the Great Bray Shaman and the Beast of Chaos Zangor have all gone down 5 points. But there has been a lot of glow ups and there's no surprise that there's a lot of red on this screen. The Dragon Ogre Shagoth went up a massive 120 points. The Bestigors have gone up 95 points. Your Beast of Chaos Zangor have gone up 90 points. Your Centigors, your Saigon, your Gorgon have gone up 85 points. The Dragon Ogres have gone up 80. The Zangor Enlightened have gone up 70. Your Bulgore have gone up 65. Your Beast Lord and your Doom Bull have gone up 50 points. Your Gore have gone up 40 points. Your Ungor Raiders have gone up 35 points. Your Zangor Enlightened on disc and your Zangor Skyfires, your Chaos Warhounds, uh, Grashrak and the Despoilers, as well as your Tuskor Chariots have gone up 30. Your Ungor have gone up 15, and the Chaos Spawn, the Jabba Slythe, and the Ravening Diaflock, and the Razor Gore have all gone up 10 points. And if you're wondering at the cost of the Gibbering Congregation, it is uh, 230 points. It is three units that are going to count as your battle line. They are single, and they can only be included in a Gave Spawn army. These units must be taken as a set known as the Gibbering Congregation. Although they are a set, they are individual models. So a little like Magakin of Nurgle, the Beasts of Chaos have had a bit of an allegiance redesign, which I stated earlier that you'll either love or you'll hate. The removal of the Primordial Call Summoning will likely make you rethink about how you build your lists and how it wants to win. No longer can you just clog up the board with low quality cheap units, even summoning units onto the board. If you ran a heavy Thunderscorn or Warherd army in the past, I think in the new book there's still a lot to like, and seeing the Saigor improve makes me a little bit excited to finally see them in Age of Sigma doing something. I don't think I've ever seen or been threatened by a Saigor in the past. The updated Soul Eater ability will put fear into the average wizard, and I don't mind the Quake Free sub-faction making them priests and giving them some shenanigans with the objective. There was a lot of updates to the War Scrolls, like two wound Bestigors, your Centigors that ignore the first two wounds in each combat phase, your Chaos Warhounds being able to guarantee a minimum 5 inch charge as well as they gained extra wounds, the uh, Ungor Raiders being able to shoot once per game off the battlefield when they're in reserve. That's just a, a small sample of how many units got an upgrade and collectively you probably see the quality of your army has increased significantly. But 
with that increase in quality has seen an increase in your points as well. And I guarantee you everyone's list has now just jumped up a good probably 100, maybe even 200 points. So you probably have to likely rethink how your list is going to work and how it's going to operate and how it's going to work without the, the summoning points. I will say that I really like the improved ambushing rules. Um, I think you've got some very achievable grand strategies and battle tactics. There's a bunch of interesting spells and artifacts and command traits. I'm curious to dig a little deeper in the new Rituals of Ruin heroic action mechanic. I think there's some really interesting play when you start to play with some of the command traits or even some of the abilities and it looks like you'll still need some sacrificial gore so that when you use the Rituals of Ruin you can pass on that damage to the gore unit as opposed to taking damage to your hero. But but that's enough from me because I will go into some much greater depth with the faction with some experienced players. I've already got one lined up. Stay tuned. Keep an eye out on the channel. But I want to hear from you in the meantime, Beasts of Chaos fans. Let me know in the comments section what you think about these changes. It's probably going to take you a little bit of time to, to digest it all and to think about what these little changes across the board are going to mean for you. What units are you going to like? Is it the Tuscor Chariots? Is, is Slangor finally good? Are Saigor finally going to hit the list? Is it your uh, Warherd or your um, Thunderscorn army is going to be good? Let me know in the comments. I would be curious to hear from you what you're thinking. Thanks for hanging around until the end. I hope you enjoyed that video and you walked away with a few new ideas. Now, if you did, I would love it if you pressed like on the video as well as left me a comment with your thoughts. The conversation will continue over on Discord and the link is down below in the episode description. I also want to give a massive shout out to the AOS Coach patrons and YouTube members who are supporting the channel and the growth that you're seeing here. So cheers, you are all bloody legends. And until next time, don't roll a double one on a spellcast.